concerns over the changes brought about by industrialization and urbanization, the threats to democracy, to justice, child labor, the conditions of the poor, and the growing sense of social obligation all culminated in a reform movement called progressivism. And it was primarily the middle class. Keep in mind, in the United States, the middle class is the deciding vote. Generally, there are about a third of Americans who are going to vote the conservative way. There are about a third who vote the liberal way. And then the third in the middle, which is usually in the middle class, are the tiebreakers. They are the ones that decide which direction the country is going to move. Well, with progressivism, when the middle class became increasingly concerned about what was going on in the country and in the cities, that's when you had the rise of the progressive movement. So it was middle class, and particularly middle class women, who set out to try to fix what they saw as the problems in the United States, to end political corruption, to improve work areas and urban areas, to reform government, and to reform business. As this graph shows, there were all different flavors of progressivism. Some people were more concerned with ending child labor and not so concerned with uh, people drinking alcohol. But there were others who be, were big on prohibition, but not so much on helping immigrants or women's suffrage. So you had all different flavors of progressivism in all different areas of American life, whether it be immigration, prohibition, child labor, the power of business and antitrust, women's suffrage, all of these different elements combined to make not a systematic movement, but a general pressure on leadership to make changes in the way things were in the United States. One of the great examples of the middle class becoming concerned was the Settlement House movement, most famously Jane Addams in Chicago. She was the wife of a banker and she bought a big house down in the uh, poor area of town and made it into what we would call today a community center, a place where the people, the poor people of the neighborhood could be helped. And it was staffed by primarily middle-class women who were going in to try to help the less fortunate. And as Jane Addams said, the sense of social obligation develops among the middle class and particularly middle class women. And so they go into these poor areas, the places where the, the tenements and the working class in virtually every major city in America. It wasn't just Chicago. She was just kind of the leader of this uh, settlement house movement. And challenges the rugged individualism of the 19th century, saying that we presuppose each citizen could take care of themselves. But in this new world, that's not the case. And so there is a sense of social obligation that 
People must help other people. The goal of the Settlement House movement was to establish these centers for middle class so settlement workers would live hoping to share knowledge and culture with and alleviate the poverty of their low class neighbors, low income neighbors. Okay, let's look at that statement for just a second. First of all, these settlement workers, this generates a whole new occupation. This is the beginning of the professional social worker. And so the settlement house movement contributes to something that we still see today, and that is the whole field of social work. But the criticisms of progressivism is that it was a white middle class movement trying to reinforce white middle class ways of life and morals on other people. And you see that in this statement also. Share knowledge, that's fine, but culture? And so one of the cr criticisms of progressivism in general and the Settlement House movement in particular is that they are trying to force these low-income neighbors, particularly the immigrants, to Americanize and accept white middle-class ways of life. So some of the services that these settlement houses uh, provided were night schools for adults, particularly English classes for immigrants. Kindergarten classes, some place where the small children could go to be off the streets. Clubs for older children. A public kitchen. Now, this was not handing out food. This was teaching the women how to prepare nutritious food. It was an art gallery, a coffee house, a gymnasium. I've never quite understood the gymnasium part. If I had just worked a 12-hour shift in a factory, I don't need to go and work out, I don't think, but it was there. A bathhouse, music groups, and finally, labor-related divisions. This was to help people get jobs. Remember, at this time, there's no such thing as unemployment insurance. And if you were laid off or fired by your employer, which happened frequently, there was very little job security for the working class. And so one of the things the Settlement House did was to try to provide employment assistance for out-of-work workers. Progressivism really grew from the bottom up, from the cities and the states, before it became national. And one of the leading figures in this was a, a guy named Fighting Bob La Follette. He was governor of Wisconsin and then became a senator from Wisconsin. And he expressed much of what the progressives were all about. Opposition to political bosses. Employment of technical experts for public service. This was big among the progressives in politics. They wanted to get rid of the uh, buddy system or the patronage system where someone would be appointed to an office or to a responsibility, not because they were qualified or had any experience in it, but because they were experts in their field. Before this period, for example, the person who was the head of the police department, the person who was the head of streets and sanitation, they were political appointees 
who might know, not know a thing about police work or providing sanitation. And one of the things that the progressives did was try to bring in experts that you had to have experience to be a police chief. You had to have experience in streets and sanitation before you would be hired to run that department. And so the use of managers, of professional managers, to provide government services was a big thrust of progressivism. He also was a former populist, and therefore he was wanting some of the reforms that the populist wanted, like the direct election of senators and the direct primary for nominating candidates so that the people could vote. And that's what we have today. If you think about it, we have primary elections where a whole group of people run for the nomination, and then you have a winner from each party that gets the nomination, and then there's a vote for who wins that election. He wanted railroad regulation, and he wanted tax reform. And so La Follette is a good example of how progressivism started off at the state and local level and grew to a national movement. This emphasis on having professional managers resulted in changing in the form, changes in the form of government. For example, the mayor council uh, form of city government, where you had an elected mayor and elected council that set the policies, but you have a city manager and a professional in charge of the various departments, rather than having a, a political appointee with no experience. Another form was the council manager, where you elected a, a council and they hired professionals to run the various departments of the city. This was a major change that we still have to this day. Most of our city government is now a mayor council form of government where the citizens elect the mayor, elect the council, they set the policy, but then they hire professional managers to run the departments of the, of the city. So in an effort to clean up politics, clean up the corruption, to weaken the political bosses, the progressives followed many of the reforms that had been proposed by the populists. The secret ballot, where the bosses could not monitor who was voting for whom. A reduction in elective offices and an increase in professional managers. A direct primary system. Again, where the people would select among all the candidates, and then the final two would, vote, would go in the election. They tried to restrict lobbying, something that we still have not gotten a handle on to this day. They, it became a government function to try to help the poor because one of the things that helped the political bosses was they would do favors for the poor, and then uh, the poor would feel an obligation to the bosses, and that obligation was to vote as they were told. So the beginnings of governmental services for the poor grow out of progressivism, and the motivation was to weaken the political bosses. And then the whole area of initiative, referendum, and recall. That was a populist movement. Again, it was a way for the people 
to be able to pass laws without having to go through the legislature or the governor. When Theodore Roosevelt became president, progressivism moved to the national stage. And as this video explains, it became a movement in three primary areas, social, governmental, but also business reform in the form of national the beginnings of national regulations of business. You'll recall that in the election of 1896, the industrialists were so afraid of William Jennings Bryan and the Democrats being elected that they put up a huge campaign fund to get William McKinley elected, and they succeeded. Well, as the elections of 1900 approached and William McKinley was looking to be reelected, the industrialists had another problem. And it was a guy in New York named Theodore Roosevelt, who had made a name for himself in the Spanish American War and had parlayed that into becoming governor of New York. And he was a progressive and had been trying to crack down on business in the state of New York. Well, the industrialists needed to get rid of him, but they couldn't just shoot him, although it was tried. And so they looked around, okay, what, where can we stick Theodore Roosevelt that it will be a prestigious sounding office but it will have no power and get him out of our hair. And they decided, why not make him the vice president? And so they put Theodore Roosevelt on the ballot with McKinley in 1900 to uh, shut him down because the vice president has very little power and the slate was elected in 1900, and the industrialists kind of felt like, okay, we've got this under control. They had it under control at least until William McKinley was assassinated. And that elevated Theodore Roosevelt to the presidency. And he took no time at all to begin to interact his progressive agenda. One of the first things that his administration did was to be in what was called trust busting, using the Sherman Antitrust Act to break up these monopolistic corporations. Now, Theodore Roosevelt came from a wealthy family. His parents sat on the board of directors of major corporations. He was not against business. He was not against wealth. But what he was against was what he called the bad trusts, those that used unscrupulous business practices, those that used their power to always get their way. And so he went after the bad trusts. As he said, we draw the line against misconduct, not against wealth. So it wasn't a matter of which companies were the most successful. It was about their, the way that they gained their success and held on to their power, their misconduct. That what is what he was after. Although the Sherman Antitrust Act had been passed in 1890, it had been used primarily against the labor unions because of that phrase, restraint of trade or commerce. And so the corporate lawyers went to the courts and said that any labor strike was a strength of trade or commerce, and the courts agreed. 
However, it was the second part that the Roosevelt administration began to use against the corporations. Every person who shall monopolize or attempt to monopolize or combine or conspire with other persons to monopolize any part of trade or commerce is guilty of a felony. And this is what he used then to go after the, corp the trusts. His first case was against the Northern Securities Trust. Now, a trust is like a holding company. It has controlling interest in a whole bunch of different companies. Think of like Disney that owns ESPN, that owns uh, ABC, that owns the parks, that owns the movies. Disney is the umbrella. That's what these trusts were. And Northern Securities was J.P. Morgan's trust that controlled virtually all of the railroads between Chicago and New York City. And so they were sued using the Sherman Antitrust Act, and the courts agreed, and it forced Northern Securities to break up and make those companies independent. So this was the first successful, many, many more trust-busting cases would be filed and succeed including one against John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil. Another area that Roosevelt and the progressives went into for the first time was any kind of consumer protections. And it kind of grew out of the muckrakers. Upton Sinclair had written his book called The Jungle, he intended it to be an expose about the working conditions for the people in the meatpacking industry. But what the public paid attention to in the book was the um, conditions, the unsanitary conditions in these meatpacking plants. Theodore Roosevelt considered becoming a vegetarian after this book. And so he went out and he had that verified that what Sinclair had written about was true, and he began to get consumer protection laws like Pure Food and Drug Act passed. This was the first time that the federal government had intervened to try to uh, put restrictions on food and drugs. For before this, you could put anything in a bottle or a pill and call it a drug and claim it did it cured everything in the world. Now you have the beginning of the government saying no, you cannot mislead the public about what your what is in your product or what your product can do. Roosevelt also began to regulate the railroads with the Hepburn Act that set the regulations for deciding what was a fair rate for the railroads to charge. So here you have the government going in and putting regulations on business. This is a complete break with the philosophy of laissez-faire but as Theodore Roosevelt said, he'd rather help a working man make a living than a corporation make an extra buck. And so the regulation of business by government is part of the progressive agenda. Now, while Theodore Roosevelt was not a huge advocate for race relations, he was not 
a bigot. He invited Booker T. Washington to be a part of a group that had lunch at the White House with him. Well, South just exploded. How could you have a black man eating lunch with white people? This just violated every part of the segregation laws of the South. But Roosevelt saw the need to incorporate black leaders into helping to make government policy. At the same, at the same time, you were having the transformation of the Niagara movement into the NAACP. You'll notice that the majority of the founders of the NAACP are white. There are only two African Americans. And so this was a, an attempt by the progressives to improve the uh, discrimination against African Americans. But as I've noted before, progressivism was not a monolithic, all progressives believed the same thing. Within the Progressive Party, you had your nativists who were against immigrants. Now they might couch it in terms of, well, we're trying to protect the, uh, the working man by having less competition for the jobs. But the progressives were really about white middle-class values. That's one of the reasons that Booker T. Washington was acceptable to them because that's what he preached. But other groups that were trying to hold on to their national uh, origins or their ways or African-Americans or Mexicans who were not abiding by white middle-class standards, they became a target. And so you had this rise of nativism, this attitude that if you're not like me, a white middle-class Protestant, then we don't want you here. Because Theodore Roosevelt had served almost two full terms as president, he decided that he would abide by precedent set by George Washington and not run for re-election after his second term. And therefore he selected William Howard Taft as his successor. Taft was a progressive. He strengthened the reforms that Roosevelt had started. He did more trust busting than the Roosevelt administration had. And he also fulfilled one of the reforms that uh, the populist had first wanted and progressives adopted, and that was a federal income tax. Now, you might say, well, how is an income tax a, a progressive form? Well, the income tax was designed to tax people according to how much money they made, or a progressive tax, so that the rich would pay a greater percentage of their income than other people. And it was kind of a, uh, a throwback to the old biblical verse about to whom much is given, much is expected. They figured that a rich man making a uh, million dollars back in those days, say 100 million today, they could be taxed 70% or so, and it still would not affect how much money they had. They figured that if somebody made a million dollars, they could get by on 300,000 back in that day, which was still fabulous wealth. So 
the progressives saw the income tax as a way of redistributing the wealth, but also putting the responsibility to pay for government on, in the, on the people who could best afford to help pay for the government while keeping taxes low or at the beginning non-existent on most Americans. So Taft was a progressive. It was at this time that you had one of the great tragedies of American business happen. And it led to the first workplace safety laws. Remember before this, there were no laws that a company had to provide a safe working environment. This is the beginning of government regulation of workplace safety. And it happened one sunny spring day in New York City. People were out uh, walking on the sidewalks, going to lunch, having just a, a wonderful spring day out in the sunshine after a long winter. And all of a sudden, bodies started hitting the concrete and littering the sidewalk. What had happened was this Triangle Shirtwaist Factory, which was located on the upper floors of the building, had caught fire. Now, the owners of the Triangle Shirtwaist Company had locked the doors, had chained them shut because they were trying to keep the labor union organizers from coming in and trying to get their workers who were primarily immigrant women to join the union. There had also been some pilfering problems where the women would take a garment that they had put together and smuggle it out and sell it on the street to make some extra money. But the primary concern that led to the lockdown of the shirtwaist company was union organizers. So there was only one way in and out of the building, and there were guards posted there to make sure that the union organizers didn't get in and that the women were not stealing when they left. So when fire broke out, there was no place to get out of the building for the workers. And so some of them began to jump out the windows from five and six stories up to try to get away from the fire. And they began landing among the pedestrians on the sidewalks of New York. Hundreds of employees died in the shirtwaist company fire. And the images that were printed in the newspapers of the burned out factory, of the mothers and the husbands and the sisters of the victims filing along trying to identify their loved one who had been killed either by jumping or by burning up in the factory. These images got so many people upset that they put pressure on the government and the New York State Legislature passed the first workplace safety rules. Things like you could not ch chain the door shut. That's why today on doors, you see crash bars rather than chains. You can't get in from the outside, but you can crash out from the inside with a crash bar. That all stems from the Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire. The owners of the, tri of the company were charged with murder. They were acquitted and they reopened the company under another name. But the important thing about this Triangle Shirtwaist Company fire is the impetus it gave 
for the establishment of government regulation of workplace safety. As the presidential election of 1912 approached, Theodore Roosevelt had become upset with Taft primarily over environmental issues. Remember that Theodore Roosevelt was a conservationist. Yes, he was a big game hunter, but he knew that there were parts of the country that were being decimated by industrialists with mining and timber cutting. And so he had spearheaded the establishment of numerous national parks and forests to prevent the uh, natural America from being completely cut down or dug up. And so he was a big time conservationist. Well, Taft wasn't. And Taft had begun to lift the rate government regulations and allow industry to once again go in and become and start lumbering operations, timber operations, mining operations in these lands that Roosevelt had wanted to set aside to preserve nature. And so this issue, among others, <clears throat> led Theodore Roosevelt to come back and challenge Taft for the Republican nomination for president in 1912. When Roosevelt did not get the nomination, he formed a third party, the Progressive Party, which became known as the Bull Moose Party after an assassination attempt on Theodore Roosevelt had not wounded him. And he had said something to the effect of it takes more than a little gunshot to stop a bull moose. And so it became known as the Bull Moose Party. But that split the Republican Party and allowed the progressive Democrat Woodrow Wilson to win the presidency in 1912. Yes, Wilson was a Democrat and a progressive. I said at the beginning, progressivism is an umbrella. Both Democrats and Republicans were progressives. And so even though the party in charge of the White House changed, the attitude of progressive reform did not. It continued. One of these reforms that Wilson got through Congress was the Federal Reserve Act, setting up the Federal Reserve Bank, no longer leaving the health of the financial system in the hands of private bankers. Now the federal government would have power over the money supply, over interest rates through the Federal Reserve System. Far from laissez-faire, Wilson believed in using the federal government and its programs to try to improve the economy or to prime the economic pump, as is shown in this cartoon. So antitrust legislation, uh, things like tariff legislation, currency. He believed that the federal government should be actively working to help improve economic conditions in the country. A far cry from the laissez-faire that said government stays out of the economy. But while Woodrow Wilson was a progressive, in some areas he was not. He was an av avowed racist. He got rid of virtually all African Americans working for the federal government. And he was early on in his presidency against the vote for women. And so you had a confrontation at the White House. Now, the National Women's Suffrage Organization, 
headed by a woman named Carrie Catt, did not think it was right to demonstrate in front of the White House. But a more aggressive leader by the name of Alice Paul said, yes, we need to demonstrate. And so she organized what became known as the Silent Sentinels, middle-class women who favored the, the vote for women would stand in front of the White House with their signs. They would just stand there, silent. Mr. President, how long must women wait for liberty? Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? Wilson didn't like this, and so he had the women removed from in front of the White House by the police. As this video details, these women were thrown into prisons where they were abused, starved. In the case of Alice Paul, she went on a hunger strike and they were so afraid that she was going to die of malnutrition that they began to force feed her. But ultimately, it was Alice Paul and these imprisoned women who changed Wilson's mind, and he came around to become a supporter of women's suffrage and was a signer of the 19th Amendment, granting women the right to vote. So progressivism was a reform movement to confront the problems created by industrialization and urbanization. It had the general belief that the government could protect the public interest and restore order to society. A more activist government than had existed. And the progressives used scientific methods in their approach to solving the issues. For example, example scientific studies of society sociology, if you will, and the whole field of social work, muckraking to expose the social problems that would, it was believed then, rally people to want to solve those problems. The progressives shared the same belief as the populists, and that is power to the people. You appeal to the people's consciousness. You get the people directly involved and you remove impediments to popular involvement like the political bosses, like uh, the state legislature selecting senators. The bottom line was they believed if you put political power back in the hands of the people, that the people would demand change. So grassroots organizing. They believed in using government to bring about reform. And within the government and the courts, they began to crack down on these exploitive business practices that had helped the industrialists build their incredible fortunes, but also their monopolies. They passed constitutional amendments. We've talked about how they saw the graduated federal income tax as a reform that taxed the wealthy more than the rest of the country. The 17th Amendment for the direct election of senators removed the political bosses, put power in the hands of the people. The 18th Amendment, prohibition, outlawing the manufacture and sale of alcoholic beverages, 
they saw this as, remember back to the Eddie Murphy movie, cleaning up the environment, the social environment. If people were not wasting their money on alcohol, if people were not getting drunk, then other social problems like theft and uh, violence would not be as prevalent. And so for many progressives, the silver bullet to solving the prime of the, the problems of poverty and violence and crime and prostitution and all those kinds of things, we just get rid of the alcohol, people in their right minds would do the right thing. And so, you, again, the progressive attitude, you change the social environment, you change the behavior of the people. That's what the 18th Amendment was all about. And finally, the 19th Amendment, providing women with the right to vote. Again, it was believed by the progressives. And remember, many of the uh, uh, workers in the progressive movement were middle class white women. And they were believed to be more moral, more upright, less corruptible than men. And therefore, by allowing women to vote, you would bring a new morality to the voting booth. So progressivism was an attempt to correct the abuses bought, brought on by industrialization and urbanization, but within a capitalist system through representative democracy. The three major areas of focus of the progressives were to change society, to reform government, and to regulate business. And that would then accelerate the improvement of the United States towards greater perfection. So let's use this crash course video to summarize the progressive movement. A reform movement brought about primarily by the white middle class that helped the poor, but always through the lens of white middle class value, that began the process of regulating business, providing consumer protections, providing workplace safety. All of these things that we have come become so familiar with today, they start with the progressive movement. 